Hi, everyone. Um, hi, <laughs> I'm Rendy Murphy, um, epidemiologist and director of disease surveillance at the Mobile County Health Department, here to give you our um, COVID update for um, July 14th. Um, before we get started, I had a colleague um, who suggested that maybe I um, give a little bit more background on myself and my education and experience as it relates to my position here at Mobile County Health Department. Um, I spent about the first 10 years of my career as a microbiologist working on um, foodborne bacterial diseases and then went to work for the Centers for Disease Control about a little over 20 years ago working with vector-borne infectious diseases. With CDC, um, I have worked in a lot of areas, vector-borne, um, global migration and quarantine, epidemic intelligence service, career epidemi epidemiology officer. But for the last 10 so years of my 20-year career with, with CDC, I um, conducted and led and participated in just dozens and dozens and dozens of outbreak investigations, some of them very far places, um, investigated Ebola in Liberia, went to Haiti after the earthquake to do disease surveillance. So when I come to this podium to talk to you about the outbreak investigation, this is really the science that is the passion of my life and how it landed me um, giving these 2.30 updates every day. I'm not real sure um, I understand, but we are committed to continuing to share with you the information, but just wanted to make sure you guys appreciate that I'm a scientist and have been a scientist for a long time. Sort of becoming um, a spokesperson for the agency is a, a bit of a other duties as a sign situation. So I will go ahead and give you our updates today around the world. Again, we have more than 13 million cases with over nearly 575,000 deaths. In the United States, we have 3.4 million cases of COVID-19 with 136,000 deaths. In Alabama, I'm just under 57,000 cases with 1,136 deaths. And today for Mobile County residents, we are reporting on 5,255 cases of COVID-19. 105 cases were added yesterday. Now, if you pay so much attention to these reports that you do the math each day, if you compare today's report, today's number, um, 5,255, um, to the number that we reported yesterday, which was 5,110. That's an increase of 145, not just 105 added yesterday. But what happens is we report the number added for yesterday, right, as our daily increase, but cases are added for the prior couple of days. So you will see the bar charts um, on our 14 day window increase. And then also by the time we run the report, sometimes there are already lab results that have come in for today and we won't be reporting on those until tomorrow in the bar chart. So that is a little bit of an explanation for the difference in those numbers. So again, 105 added just yesterday. We are still not able to report on the number hospitalized and died as again, our systems, our surveillance systems, our investigation systems have been overwhelmed and we are having to make some um, upgrades or adapt to the change in our, our outbreak by adapting our surveillance system. So as soon as we have that back um, online in its new form, we will add those to the report. We just don't want to, we want to report numbers that we believe in, that we think are close, even though there is never perfection in the world of, of disease surveillance, because we don't want to report numbers that are maybe grossly overestimated or grace, grossly underestimated that might cause you to get the wrong idea about how our outbreak is moving. So again, we are in an accelerated phase of our outbreak. We have seen more cases over the last two weeks than at any other time in our outbreak, far more um, than during um, our, when we first started seeing cases jump up um, in, the, in early April. I believe the week of April 5th was sort of our worst week for a while until Labor Day, I mean, until Memorial Day. And then after the Memorial Day holiday, and then again with the, with the July 4th holiday, we've just seen an explosion in the number of cases reported each day that we are really concerned about. So we're still 
um, reminding everyone that the only way we can slow the epidemic is through public health measures, what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions, since we don't have a drug to treat COVID and we don't have a licensed vaccine to treat to prevent COVID, we have to rely on these community mitigation measures, these non-pharmaceutical interventions like staying at home if you're sick, um, wear a face covering when you're out, um, wash your hands um, often, use hand sanitizer, cover your cough, um, adhere to isolation and quarantine guidelines if you are exposed or um, diagnosed with COVID. So again, these are the only things that we have at our fingertips right now to try to slow the spread of this illness, this disease, this pandemic, which is taking over and overwhelming um, all of our systems. I just wanted to remind you, well, first of all, thanks to Dr. Cepeda yesterday for filling in for me while I was occupied elsewhere. But in this more, you know, the last couple of weeks, we really have seen the younger age groups driving our transmission. So now almost 60% of our cases are you know between the ages of 18 and 50 or 55 so just an enormous growth and and mostly due to younger people who are, are less susceptible to severe complications and death and those are the people that we need wearing your face covering and not touching your 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 face and um, staying at home if you're sick and and physical distancing with that six feet between you and anyone else in the community I added a, a chart to the, um, to the weekly expanded report to show you the growth by age group. You can see this green bar is, is the um, 25 to 49 age group, and that's where we're seeing the most exponential growth in the number of cases diagnosed and reported to the health department. And then the map that we show, we began a couple of weeks ago only showing the um, geography for the last two weeks, for the cases that were in the last two weeks. So even though it, the look of the map is very similar, similar, take pay a c close attention to that because it is changing some as we start to see sort of a little bit more activity um, in South Mobile County. And um, you know, 36605 is no longer our darkest color. Um, so maybe things are improving there, but we'll, we're still seeing a lot of activity in 36608 and 36695. So please um, take a look at that. Our, um, our daily moving average is jumping way up. So on average now we're seeing about 100 or more cases added on average each day. This is twice as much as it was just 14 to 21 days ago. So again, a rapid increase. And the number of testing has stayed about the same over the last couple of weeks, but the percent positive of tests um, has continued to stay high. Um, last week it was it was 19%. So let me get to a couple of questions that we've been asked. Um, first, let me mention to the folks out there in um, healthcare centers and schools where you're doing um, planning, the new quarantine and isolation guidelines have been released by the Alabama Department of Public Health. Um, we'll be trying to review these and understand how they affect our case and contact investigation um, and try to simplify these so that we can give you the best advice possible about how long you need to isolate and quarantine if you've been diagnosed with COVID, have symptoms of COVID, or if you've been exposed to COVID. All right. Last week, someone asked me a question about um, self-serve drink machines at restaurants. And yes, um, the Safer at Home order that was amended on, on June 30 and extends through the end of this month, it states that establishments shall disallow self-service by guests at drink stations, buffets, or salad bars. So this means that an, a, a restaurant, you know, a sandwich shop or a um, chicken fast food restaurant or a burger joint should not hand you an empty cup and then let you go to the drink machine to fill it with ice and fill it with Coca-Cola or Dr. Pepper or tea, whatever your, your favorite drink is. That is disallowed under the Safer at Home order amended on June 30 and um, that which goes through July 1st. So again, um, disallow self-service by guests at drink stations, buffets, or salad bars. 
So this applies to like salsa bars, um, to, you know, condiment um, bars. All of that stuff is, it's self-service is disallowed. So that you have to be served by someone in that establishment who is wearing a face covering. All right, here are some questions from media and the face and Facebook. So from media saying that we've learned that Dr. Burks is coming to Alabama and meeting with Governor Ivey this week. Um, do I know anything about that? Um, I am not aware of a visit um, by Dr. Burks to Alabama and um, don't know that anyone, I have no awareness that anyone else from MCHD has been invited to attend. Let's see, does, does the health department believe that reopening schools right now um, is the right idea based on the current rising cases? So this is a very tricky decision and it's not easy. There are lots of recommendations out there for so safely reopening schools. We are consulting with a lot of schools who are choosing to reopen to really talk with them about their plans and trying to help them put things into place to keep the students and teachers as safe as they can be. But I do believe that this ongoing, very accelerated phase of our outbreak right now is gonna make it a challenge to identify, control, and mitigate um, exposure in highly congregate settings like schools, healthcare facilities, long-term care facilities, assisted living, group homes, detention centers, all of those places where you bring people together. It's gonna to be very difficult to implement the um, restrictions of the safer at home order. But again, um, these are tough decisions to make and they are not made based on just health, COVID health alone. There's a lot of you know, social context to the need for children to be at, educational context, nutritional, um, reasons for sending um, children back to school. So there are a lot of things that go into play and it is not an easy decision. Schools. Over schools, yeah. yeah. Right, so my colleague here is reminding me that, you know, we are not the, the, um, the authority over schools. We don't have any authority over schools. Sometimes we do a courtesy review for their kitchen when they've been closed for the summer and are getting ready to open back up, but we don't dictate um, what the schools do, and I believe the State Education Authority, um, Commissioner Mackey, has released that just those decisions to local superintendents and school boards. All right, can I talk about two myths being per perpetuated? <laughs> one is that multiple positives on one person are reported as additional cases. Yes, this is a myth. We, we, th we talk about cases as an individual. So a case is an individual and, and each individual gets an investigation. If multiple lab results come in, then we take all of those lab results and attach it to that one end of investigation for that one individual. So this is a myth. If someone tests positive multiple times, they are only counted as one case. Also, if you have someone living in your household that is is lab positive who is counted as a case. The household members are considered close contacts of a case. They are entered in our system as contacts. They do not get counted as a case unless two things happen. If they become symptomatic, regardless of what their test is, or if they get a positive test. So if either of those things happen to a contact, then they become a case, but case, cases and their household then the number is not like yourself your husband or your wife and your three kids it counts as one case all right here's another one that says another myth anyone who dies while infected with covid19 is automatically reported as a covid death even though the death may have nothing to do with covid this also is a myth but this decision is made by the attending physician the attending physician is the one who decides based in his or her clinical judgment whether the patient died with a positive COVID test or died from complications of COVID-19 disease or died from the illness. So that is left up to the clinicians, the physicians in the hospital, the medical officers at nursing homes, and the medical examiner. Those professionals are the ones that make that determination and then when that death is reported to um, the state, there is a team at the state that reviews the medical records in detail to assess 
if that was an appropriate um, died with COVID designation or not. Let's see another myth. Let's see. So someone's asking about getting tested positive and then having another test and it's negative. So this happens. Um, what we try to tell people to do is if you are going to get more than one test, please get it from the same, the same provider and through the same lab so that you're comparing apples and apples, not comparing a test done at this lab, which might be a PCR test, to a test done over there, which might be a rapid test, those sorts of things, because those can very much complicate the picture. So if you test positive, and then you choose to get tested later on and test negative, usually that means that you have resolved your illness, right? That the virus has, um, you know, been eliminated for, from your body by your immune system. And that happens, um, luckily it happens a lot with COVID because we have a lot of people who recover from COVID with no co severe complications. Then someone asking about how COVID compares to the flu and admit that the numbers are off due to um, inaccuracies in um, surveillance um, systems and reporting. So yeah, you know, I've seen some, some predictions that based on what we know about COVID, which is, you know, very mild to the, the vast majority of children that we expect you know, this flu, if, if the next flu season is anything like previous flu seasons, we will probably see more pediatric deaths related to flu than we will from COVID. Um, and I don't know how that compares with, um, you know, middle-aged and, and adult and elderly comp, um, uh, patients, but it is going to be difficult to tease all of this out um, come fall when our um, seasonal COVID picks back up. Um, so again, another reason to be um, somewhat alarmed at the dramatic um, rise in our number of cases. Okay, so just three more things. Um, I think one of them we've already covered. So someone asking that if, if an, like say I'm exposed today and I didn't know it and I'm around someone else today, can I transmit it to that someone else? So in most situations, that the answer to that is no, because it takes several days for the virus to circulate and replicate enough in your body so that it can be detected by PCR. However, if you, you know, it's, it's possible that, um, that someone may have been exposed to the same surfaces as I did or exposed to the same source as I was, or, you know, um, God forbid if they like, you know, played with my mask that I'd been breathing on all day. So um, it's unlikely that if you were infected on today that you would transmit it to somebody else today. It takes a couple of days for you to be able to do that. But just recognize that there, there we know that there is it's transmission through touching surfaces and touching people and touching your face. So keep your hands out of your face, wear your face covering, wash it at the end of the day. And then the last two things here, one was about the number of the case count and why that changes. And then when will deaths and hospitalizations be reported again? So I've already um, addressed both of those. We will, um, we're taking a look at a, a better way, hopefully, to um, determine the number of deaths and hospitalizations. And when we do, we will put those back into our report. And unless there's anything else on Facebook, teacher tests positive and teaches several blocks of class periods, should all students associated with that teacher quarantine also? Okay, so the question is, if a teacher tests positive for COVID and they've been, you know, maybe in several different classrooms or in the same classroom throughout the day with different classes, should all of those students be quarantined? And the answer to that question is, if the students have been within six feet of the teacher within fit for 15 minutes or longer, the answer is yes. Children would be considered close contacts and they would have to go home and quarantine for 14 days. Again, if you're adhering to the guidance and you put six feet of distance away from teacher and students, then the students don't have to go home. But if you've not implemented that recommendation in your facility, then if the teacher is positive and was at school while symptomatic or while positive, 
and they were within six feet of their students for 15 minutes or longer, then yes, the entire class or the entire blocks would have to go home immediately and stay there for 14 days. So we'll answer more of your questions tomorrow. I believe we'll still be doing this, right? No unified command press briefing. So we'll talk to you again tomorrow at 2.30 um, to provide some more insights on our COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks, everyone.